Okay, I have to admit, I am rather frustrated. I recorded a great message on John 15, and somehow the computer crashed, the files corrupted, and I don't think I can reproduce it. So I'm going to just briefly try to cover what I covered without getting as into it. Um, I've seen lately people are circulating the rounds uh, using John 15 to say that if you don't bear fruit, God's going to cast you into the fire. Um, so I wanted to visit this section and see what it really says. Um, let me just read the verses and kind of comment as I go. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Now consider the relationships. Christ is the vine, the son, the beloved son of God, and his father, the one in charge of keeping the vineyard, is the father. So that's the relationship, is that the father loves the vine and loves all of the branches. And his husbandry is a fatherly care. Not, I mean, this guy isn't running into the vineyard and ticked off at everything and got an axe and the matches and just burning the whole thing down. Now, there is a vineyard that is not the vine of Christ, but is the vine of the earth that Christ will tread, right? And the wine press of the wrath of God, and that the vine of the earth will be cast into that. But this is the vine that is Christ Himself and His many members. So we are branches who have been grafted into Christ Himself. Uh, Romans talks about our being grafted in, and we weren't grafted into Israel. We are grafted into Christ, who's really the true olive tree. And he is a vine. This is a vine tree. And the vine tree grows not up into the air where the branches are so high you can't reach them and yet the l birds of the air are lodging in those branches like in the parable of the mustard seed. That thing that the mustard seed produced, should have produced a bush but became this evil tree, that is evil. And the fallen angels are in the branches and this thing is a mess. But this is a vine tree which spreads along the ground. And the way it grows is by spreading out, not by gathering in. And I think that's really important because, um, you know, in institutional churches, the emphasis is always gathering in. Come to our church. We're building our church. We're trying to gather as many people in one place, listening to one guy doing the same thing as possible. And those are really becoming barns for the tares to be burned, which we'll get to that, because that's actually relevant to this. In contrast, the branches of the vine spread out to bear fruit, and their growth and increase is in clusters, uh, uh, branch, branches spread out with the clusters of the grapes are the uh, fruit and the bran branches just keep spreading out but they're one because of the life that's in them they're all branches of the same vine um, so it's a going out and it's a spreading out not a gathering in in terms of its growth um, and the father is the one taking care of this and the son is the reality of the vine Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Now, if you look in the Greek, the King James is not perfect. It's the best translation we have. But there are some word choices that I think it's important to look at the Greek. And in this case, the every branch that bears in fr uh, every branch that bears not fruit, he takes away. That is can be. Um, take away like a removal but it's also taken away to lift up uh to raise up and keep in suspense okay so um to carry it lift up so the i mean it can have a negative connotation but in the context of the vineyard the a branch that's unhealthy is lifted up and put on like a little structure where it gets special attention so remember that the branches are the sons of god they're in christ and the 
you know, you have to get this relationship straight before you come to these verses and start. It's sad to me how people read this and think that the father's in there, rip you out and throw you away and cast you in the fire. And they forget that he's the father and they forget that you're a son and that the, you're a part of Christ. This is the son of God with his many members, the body of Christ, an organism, all indwelt by the same life. And God has committed himself to caring for this branch, uh, the branches of this vine. And Christ himself is the surety of the promise, which we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but yeah, so I believe that taketh away here actually would be better translated to be lifted up. And I think some translations have that. Some commentaries do. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he lifts up is what I would say. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges. Now that is pruning, that he may bring forth more fruit. So the father does do a pruning work. And this is not necessarily because you did something bad. This is because you were bearing fruit. And, you know, the Lord shippers won't allow for seasons in the Christian life. They won't allow for seasons where you're kind of barren and, and pruned back so that you can bear more excellent fruit. And if you go through a season that seems dry or nothing's happening, then they'll say, well, you must have sinned and that's why you're being disciplined. Well, discipline from God's point of view is not justice being met out for your sins. It's training in righteousness training and partaking of his holiness training and exercises your senses to determine between good and evil to discern and that training is necessary for bad or good and especially if you're good then that shows that you have an aptitude and he's going to train you even more and that's going to become a discipline for you so the branches that bear not fruit he lifts up and the branches that bear fruit he prunes Either way, both of them are getting attention that they may feel is negative. So they have to remember that the husbandman is their father who loves them. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. So we are clean. Then he says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. So fruit bearing is not the work of the branches. The emphasis is not the fruit bearing, the emphasis is the abiding. And as we abide in him, we bear fruit. And this abiding in him has to do with being in him and he in us. And his life flows. Who's in charge of the life? Christ is. He says, I have authority to give life to whomever you've given me, right? So he's the one who has the authority of the life. You can't make resurrection happen. All you can do is abide in the Lord. And he promises that if you do, you will bear fruit. Now, this is not, again, the work of the flesh or work of the effort. This is a rest of dwelling in the Lord. Abide in me. You are in him already. You've been grafted in. You are indwelt by him. You're sealed by him. You're saved in him, and you're a member of him. You have to see that relationship before you can even understand these verses. Um, okay, so then he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, right? For without me, you can do nothing. Once again, it's got to be Christ. It's the life of Christ that produces fruit. It is not the life of self-effort. It is the life of Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I'm a branch of the vine. The vine's life has to flow through me to produce food, fruit. And my uh, job is to abide in him. Now here's the verse. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Well, this is interesting. Who gathers them and casts them into the fire? God? No. Men. So God the Father, we do see throwing people into our Jesus, our Christ, a lake of fire at the end of the great white throne judgment. Is that what this is talking about? No. This is men doing the casting into fire. So that cannot be something for the next age. That has to be something in this age. And it is negative. Okay? 
So what is this? And it's gather them and cast them into the. It's a plural. They are burned. What what is this? Is this eternal judgment? No, I do not believe it is. But if you do not abide in the Lord, you are cast forth as a branch and withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire. So, first of all, we need to see what abiding in the Lord means, and this takes me to my favorite verse in 1 John 2. Um, okay, I'm going to have to make the Bible program go away because my Camtasia software sample rate is just not lining up with my sound card. I'm having some issues with this audio interface. Uh, I'm going to have to troubleshoot it a little bit. Um, anyway, I was getting into 1 John 2.24. Let that therefore abide in you, which you've heard from the beginning. If that which you've heard from the beginning abides in you, you also shall abide in the Son and in the Father. So that word abide has to do with letting a message heard that you heard from the beginning dwell in you. See, John and first and third, second and third John were all written after Revelation, after John came back from Patmos and dwelt among the church at Ephesus to write these letters to restore them to their first love. So he continually tries to bring their attention to that which they heard from the beginning. They'd been fighting so hard in the doctrinal wars that now they needed to be returned to the simplicity that's in Christ. So he keeps bringing them back to the basic thing. And abiding in the Lord here is if that which you heard from the beginning shall remain in you or abide in you, you also will continue in the Son and in the Father. You will abide in the Son and in the Father. Same Greek word. Then he says, and this is the promise that he's promised us, even eternal life. So the message you heard is a promise of eternal life. And remember, God who... Uh, couldn't swear by anybody else, he couldn't find anybody else to swear by, swore by himself that by two immutable things, uh, what is it, that by two immutable witnesses or two immutable things, we who have fled uh, refuge to him might have hope, right? This hope is a sure promise, an oath. It's the worthy oath. It's the promise that God has made Christ a surety. You know, Christ's death was for our redemption and it ransomed us, but it also made him a surety, like cutting a covenant. So be it unto me if I don't fulfill the words of this covenant, right? And that's what Christ has become. He's become the surety of the new covenant to guarantee the promise of eternal life to all the seed. And he said, of all those that you've given me, Father, I have lost none except the son of perdition that the scripture may be fulfilled. That's speaking of Judas. And we know that he keeps us in himself and we can't be cast out of himself we're part of the vine those who are predestined from the foundation of the world and foreknown to be the members of the body of christ a single organism consisting of the head and the members god views it all as one unit except christ has the first place because he's the firstborn of all creation and the firstborn from among the dead and he's going to have the preeminence and we love him he is our pride groom and he is the son of the father from eternity past to whom he delights in but we are also the sons of god who've been grafted in and made members of the body of christ and are branches of the vine and the way we got in was by being cleansed by the word he spoke to us and the way we abide and rest in him is to hold on to the promise. Let that therefore abide in you, which you've heard from the beginning. If that which you've heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise that he has promised to unto us, even eternal life. It's a promise of God. It's the oath. It is dwelling and always coming back to the assurance that he who promised is faithful and he will also do it. So we know that eternal life and fruit bearing and everything rests on the promise of God and we just need to abide in that promise and let that promise abide in me because Jesus said if you abide in me and my word abides in you. So we need to have the word abiding in us and that is Christ himself and it is uh, through that that we enjoy our union with Christ so that his life can flow. And so we need to have our heart and our mind and everything set on the gospel, the message we've heard from the beginning, the promise of eternal life. If we don't, we will wither. And then he says, 
And this is the promise that he's promised uh, unto us, even eternal life. 1 John 2.26, this, these things have I written to you concerning them that seduce you. Here's the men. But the anointing you've received from him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it taught you, you will abide in him. So that anointing is going to teach you the difference between the seduction and the deception by the seducers and the gospel. So you'll grow in your ability to discern between truth and error, and you'll keep coming home to the gospel because the anointing that dwells in you, the life that dwells in you, this is his job. But if you do not abide in him and you're not focused on the gospel, then you'll wither and you'll lose spiritual strength, you'll lose your sense of assurance, and you know what you'll do? You'll start to listen to men because you'll get hungry and thirsty. And you'll be like, I need something, you know. So then the seducers come. And these men will gather you into their barns and will burn you. Now, ultimately, those barns are for the tares to be gathered into the end time harvest and cast into the real fire. But for you, that fire is the persecution you will experience, I believe by those who seduce you because you weren't abiding in the word. And you have, it's like the babes in Ephesians who are being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and uh, in the cunning craftiness of men who are with a view to the building up of a system of error right through their false doctrines. Baby believers go through this until they're rooted and grounded in Christ and realize what the source of the life is. And... Uh, as you're not bearing fruit because you're not abiding in him, that's a perfect opportunity for the enemy to come and say, see, you're not bearing fruit. You need to listen to my teaching. And then he sends some seducing man who gives you 12, 25 steps. You know, if you'll follow me, you'll get blessed and you'll bear fruit and you'll have an abundant life. And you go follow these people. You chase after them. You find yourself in a barn being burned because the anointing you have will start to cause you to discern this seduction. And you'll say, this isn't for me. And when you do that, you'll get in trouble. <laughs> and once you get in trouble, that's where the burning really starts. The fires of persecution. Because that's what Peter and James said, you know, the, the, the fiery trial. What is it? It's the trial of your faith. Not that God wants to see if your faith is real, but he wants to show you that your faith is real. That which he put in you is precious beyond measure, and it will survive any test. And now you're in these environments because you withered and you didn't cleave to the gospel and you went and listened to the seducers and men gathered you to cast you into the fire. But you know what? You might have been burned in it, but you're not going to be hurt by the second death and you're not going to be cast into the lake of fire by God. You're going to wake up because of the anointing that abides in you and you're going to come back. So this is sort of a cyclical thing. If you're in him and you don't bear fruit, you're raised up and you get special care. But if you refuse to abide, well, then he'll let you go. And the men will gather you into their situation where you'll be persecuted. And eventually, the hope of the gospel will have to become your comfort in that situation. And when it does, you'll find yourself abiding in him again. So that's how it works. And this is the care he gives to his branches. He is faithful. And you may drift off into any kind of thing, but he is the husbandman of the vine who takes care of all the branches with the same energy and loves you to the uttermost because he's the father who sent his only begotten son to die for you. The vine cut himself open so you could be grafted in. It's deeply personal matter to the father whether or not you make it through, and you will. All you need for your fruit bearing, though, is to abide in him. The subject of F First John is fruit bearing by abiding in him and having his life flowing through you. And you won't bear the fruit until you learn to cleave to the gospel, because that's how you abide in him. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, what word? That which you heard from the beginning concerning the promise of eternal life. Believing the gospel is everything. Okay, hopefully this recorded. I'm having a lot of technical issues. I've recorded this message three times. All right, see ya.